like that, so I'm pretty cool at that. I'll give you a lot of tips. Um, I would like to show you something. Uh, <laughs> wait, I have to click this beautiful link, actually. Okay, so, yeah. So I built this amazing website uh, recently, and, uh, yeah. And you see that I tested this website quite extensively. Uh, you kind of, I think, get an idea of what this website does. Uh, well, when I click like, it says thank you. And then I can go back, and then there's one more like. I can give you the URL, but I'm sure you guys will break it, so uh, no. Okay, now I'm gonna have to go back to... How do I go back? Aha! Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so this was a super simple website and I asked myself the question, okay, uh, to build this website, this is pretty much uh, how the code base looks like. It's a very, very primitive website. Uh, whenever there's a, there's a Rails controller, uh, there's a Rails uh, action, and whenever uh, the code uh, hits that action, so there's a form, um, we create a like in the database. Nothing super fancy. Of course, there's a, uh, the, the app is deployed on Kubernetes with, with Webpacker in front of it. No, no, it's just a box somewhere. Anyway, so uh, this application does this thing. Now, the goal of my uh, curiosity, if you will, was to figure out what happens before it hits my code. What happens to the request from uh, whenever I click the, the super amazing like button, uh, until it gets to this code. And uh, yeah, this is kind of where it goes. So there's a lot of things that actually happen. Uh, some of them touch on uh, things like uh, how does the request travel through the network? Some of them touch on how does the request reach Nginx and what does Nginx add to it? Now I'm gonna focus only on the Rails side and the Rails side works pretty much like this. I think you might see like a recurring theme in these GIFs. If you're sick of the 90s, yeah, wait for 15 minutes. Uh, David doesn't have any GIFs, right? Uh -huh. All right, so this is pretty much what happens when uh, the, the request hits Rails. Um, at some point, the browser sends a, 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 assembles a request and sends it over to, to, to the Rails application. And it undergoes a bunch of stages until it actually reaches your code. 
Actually, it looks more like this. The request is a lot simpler when it starts, and when it, when it reaches your uh, Rails app, it is a lot more complex. Uh, in this case, uh, a lot of information is added to the request that is needed for the Rails app, and this thing is the, the Rails app. Uh, so that hand over there is your Rails app, this is the internet, and there's a bunch of stuff in the request. The request looks like, like this. Yeah. The request looks pretty much like this. It's a, uh, it contains a bunch of information that uh, allows your Rails application to understand uh, what things uh, have been done and where, and by whom. Uh, the request contains the URL, uh, the verb, uh, the, 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 the HTTP version. It contains a bunch of headers uh, which are used by the Rails application to do all sorts of things. Uh, for example, what is the URL of the page where this request has originated? Uh, or uh, does this person use a proper browser? Uh, in this case, of course. Now. Uh, in case of the Rails app, it also sends a bunch of stuff as the form data. This is, we won't cover this because nobody cares about that, but uh, this is pretty much what the request is. At the same time, uh, this is what happens when I click the like button and the request goes to the server. At the same time, I did something else. I ran this command on a computer somewhere. What this command did is it actually runs Puma and uh, it runs uh, a piece of code inside Puma uh, that is the run uh, method of the server class. Let's look at that. Uh, the code is very well visible, that's the point of it. Um, the run method does the following thing. If you look at it, it uh, is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's surprisingly readable if you don't have to read Ruby. Uh, it, runs uh, in a thing called Lopez mode sometimes, which is a weird name for a server to run in, but whatever. But the most important thing is here. It creates a thread pool from, of a certain number of threads, and for every single thread in the thread pool, uh, whenever there's a client, it can actually execute some code for that client. This is uh, how Puma works. So uh, it creates a thread pool with handlers for uh, different clients. Um, then we go to the process client method, which is handled in the thread pool whenever there's a client connection established, which is the case when I'm trying to send a request. What it does is it runs an infinite loop, you see here, while true, and uh, it runs a thing called handle request. In that case, the handle request takes the IO object of, uh, of the request that is arriving and does a bunch of things to it. So, the next thing that Puma does is it runs an infinite loop. The infinite loop, as you just saw, will call the handle request method whenever the request arrives. The handle request method will actually take care of our message. I noticed just now the, the difference in resolution between these two. It's so authentic. Now, the handle request method will be executed whenever the message actually arrives to the server. This is when, this is not when the Rails app boots, no, this is when the, uh, when you actually click the button and the, the request gets to the server. There's a bunch of things that happen here, and uh, if you see the, 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 the upper part of the code, there's comments, so you can look at that. Now, the, the thing that happens here is, uh, Puma does a bunch of things, uh, sets up a bunch of environment variables, and then does the most beautiful thing ever, which is this. So after setting up a bunch of environment variables, Puma um, does this thing. And this is uh, calling our application code. This is the first place where Puma enters our application code, or where Rails actually executes our application code with the environment that contains the request. And this brings us to the next phase, which is Rack. Now, most of you have heard of Rack or used Rack, uh, so I won't get really deep into this, but Rack is this uh, beautiful standard uh, for building uh, web applications. Uh, on one hand, you have servers. On the other hand, you have applications, um, like servers like uh, Puma and uh, frameworks like Rails. Um, and Rack is a standard for those two to, to interact. 
Rack is a very simple standard. Rack relies on the fact that there's a, a, a Rack compatible app uh, implements a call function, to, a call method, uh, to which you pass in an environment, just as we saw Puma did. And um, any Rack compatible uh, app, any Rack compatible framework should return these three things, which is the status, uh, a bunch of response headers, and a response body wrapped in an array. Now, the thing is, you see this, and this is what happens. Uh, this is a Rack compatible application, and therefore we can actually put it into, uh, we can actually run it with Puma, as long as it returns the right things. But a standard isn't a library, and you, when you did like bundle update of a thing, you might have seen that Rack is actually getting updated, so Rack is, a, is an actual thing, not just a standard. Well, Rack comes with a couple, well, Rack comes with a couple of things. Uh, Rack comes with uh, an idea uh, that they implemented there called middlewares. Um, for any Rack application, you can uh, add a bunch of middlewares in, and the environment will be passed from one middleware to another one. Any middleware is able to either pass it to the next middleware, so continue the request, execute a bunch of stuff, continue the request, or uh, return a response in the Yeah. Here's how it works. Oh, yeah. Um, now, this, again, is still a principle. What Rack as a library adds is an ability to actually build those middlewares. That is a builder interface. Also, this is uh, a result of a bunch of under construction GIFs. And the top GIF, I think it took them more time to build the top GIF than to actually fix the damn website. It's so complicated. Anyway, um, so this is the, the, the Rack uh, middleware building interface. Uh, it relies on a thing called use. Uh, and you can uh, ask an application, a Rack application, to actually use different middlewares. And those middlewares uh, look pretty much like this. Oh, no, no. So uh, uh, I'll show a, a, a middleware in a bit. But uh, getting back, before we do the call of the handle request, Rails actually creates a Rack app which will inject a bunch of middlewares. And we can see those middlewares by running Rails middleware. And uh, yeah, this is the amount of uh, the, the number of uh, individual pieces of uh, Rack middleware that Rails uses. Uh, this is a standard Rails application generated with Rails new, so that's kind of a lot. Uh, different pieces of this. Implement all of the, so all of them implement the call interface, um, and all of them are run within the Rails applications builder. Uh, the last one is the exit one, so the the context of the middleware doesn't get passed anywhere else. This is it. Uh, we expect my app application .routes to actually return a response, as opposed to uh, either return a response or pass it on to the next middleware. But uh, these are the, the, the pieces of middleware for a standard Rails app. Uh, some of them do interesting things, for example, active record migration check pending. Uh, what this does, if you look at the source of it, uh, it gets initialized with an app, and uh, it implements the call interface because it's a middleware. Um, it checks for the last modified time in the database, uh, if it corresponds with the last migration, and then if not, uh, if the application is too old, so if the migration version is too old, then it raises an exception. If not, it uh, calls the, it passes on the environment to the next piece of middleware. Some pieces of middleware actually don't do anything. They don't have any logic except to enrich uh, some things. For example, the remote IP does that. Uh, the remote IP is a very simple uh, piece of middleware. What it does is it uh, implements the same call interface, and in that call interface, it um, uh, puts in the environment. It just puts the remote IP because it can be calculated through multiple uh, through multiple strategies. So, for example, if you're uh, serving requests through a proxy, or uh, nginx has certain logics of passing the the, the remote IP address, and, and so on. So. Uh, this middleware handles that part. Okay, uh, what happens in this case is the, uh, the remote IP, before entering the, the, the remote IP middleware, uh, 
the environment uh, doesn't contain the key, action dispatch remote IP, and after it gets through the remote IP middleware, it has this. So this is the whole point of this piece of code. And as you saw, there's a bunch of these. Yeah, this is a bunch. Okay, now the last piece of middleware is this. So after running all of this code, Rails runs this beautiful thing. And this uh, gets us into routing. Routing is a, a very difficult problem to solve because um, let's assume you have, um, yeah, this is the routing middleware. Uh, it creates a journey router uh, which will solve the routing problem, which will actually map from the URL to the controller action. But this is not a very simple problem to solve, right? Let's imagine you have this, this thing where you have a path and you have to map it to the right controller action. Uh, here's a very simple way to implement that, right? Uh, you see, if it matches posts, uh, then you dispatch it to posts index. If it matches posts something, then you dispatch it to posts show. Unfortunately, this is extremely slow because this means that for every single route, you have to run like, a bunch of things. This is absolutely suboptimal. But, as um, Andre said in the beginning, and as uh, Ivan said a bit later, uh, we can go to Mother Nature and uh, use trees for that. Uh, well, actually not trees, but state machines. Um, and and this, is how, uh, this is how Journey resolves the routes. It builds a state machine of your routes, and uh, it matches them according to the state machine. It matches the routes according to the state machine. So, it uses a pretty smart thing to figure out which controller and which action to, to forward to. Cool, so now uh, uh, the request has been uh, mapped to a route. Uh, you found the controller, the router middleware found the controller. And what it does next is it dispatches the action to the controller. And if you look at the code of the dispatch action, of the dispatch method, uh, oh yeah, we're in the controller right now. Uh, if you look at the code of the dispatch, then uh, it instantiates the controller, then executes the action name name. And if you look at the code, you see if there is a middleware stack, then execute everything in the middleware stack. Uh, otherwise, uh, dispatch the request directly. This means that there is actually more middleware involved in the process. Um, if you look a bit upper in that same file, uh, you will see this is this is. Uh, uh, if you look a bit, yeah, this is the action controller middleware stack. Um, if you look a bit upper, then you see that actually the controllers are very much able to use uh, also rack middleware because every controller action is just a piece of rack middleware that uh, uh, the environment get, gets passed to. It's syntactic sugar around rack middleware. So for any kind of controller. You can also use the same syntax of use authentication middleware, just as you would use before or after filters. Then, of course, after you use this, you can also use before or after filters to or actions uh, to uh, enhance or uh, capture any kind of issues within your code. Um, so, to sum it up. Yeah. Uh, to sum it up, we have the following things that execute code in a Rails application. After the request reaches the Rails app, there is a bunch of pieces of middleware that gets executed. Yeah. Then there is a bunch of routing constraints. So in, after it executes all the middleware, there is routing involved. And routing not only finds the route, but also executes the routing constraints. It forwards the re rails forwards the requests to the right controller action and dispatches that. Then you have the controller, which is also able to inject rack middleware. So you can place your functionality in there as well. Of course, after rack middleware, inside the controller, you can also put your code into controller uh, filters, into the before filter. And finally, there is, there is your application code. That is the code that actually increments the like button, the, the like count. And 
obviously all of the places before that are able to execute a lot of logic. So uh, in this case, all of my logic exists in the last place, but there are many scenarios in which I want to put logic way before this. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, another beautiful thing. How do I, yeah. Okay, uh, this is just, uh, I, I, I think I think the slides will be shared so you can, uh, so you're able to steal all my gifts. Um, yeah, this is a thing that shows you all the all the code that gets executed when uh, when you do a request. This is pretty much. Okay, so uh, I'm at the final point. Uh, ah, oh, David is there for the jokes, right? Okay. Uh, so I'm at the final point. Now, for me, the conclusions of this whole experiment were the following. Uh, first of all, the it's very easy. It's very easy to look at the, through the source code of everything Rails. Rails is surprisingly well documented and uh, surprisingly well understandable. Uh, if you just read the code, it's actually not bad. It's actually not bad. I've written worse code than, than that, like a lot worse. Uh, so please don't be afraid to do that. Uh, the other thing for me is, uh, do you really need all of this, especially this little train there? Uh, as you saw, there are many places to put different pieces of functionality, and some of those places are actually more reasonable. For example, um, if I want to prevent uh, uh, like a denial of service attack, if I want to authorize requests, maybe I shouldn't do this in the controller, but maybe I can do this a lot earlier in the process. Maybe I can save myself some CPU cycles and prevent global warming. Um, of course, there's a bigger goal to this. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Uh, I spared you some time. Yeah. It's kind of it. Feel free to ask any questions. Uh, I have uh, how much time I have left? Uh, about an hour? <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, sure, feel free to ask any questions. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Ivan, thank you very much for the great energetic presentation. So, uh, based on uh, the outcome that there's a lot of complex logic happening uh, in Rails, uh, and like a lot of these middleware layers, so my question is like, we all know that uh, in order to put like a Ruby application in production, you have to have Nginx in front of it, because like yep. Nginx in C, I mean, it will protect you from simple, uh, like uh, DOS attacks, it will buffer like uh, your request. It will not yep. use your application server before it gets all the requests. And, you know, like not use your workers. So based on your research, can we not use nginx? Can we configure just Ruby application server to be like reliable enough to not require a reverse proxy as efficient as nginx? Uh, excellent question. Um... Okay, so my take on this is uh, no, uh, mostly because Nginx is incredibly parallel and incredibly powerful at certain things. Um, things like serving static assets, uh, things like... I'm assuming we serve static assets from somewhere in, on CDN. If, yeah. we, if we remove static assets. Um, yeah, I mean, even, even things like rate limiting. Nginx is great at that. It's yeah. very, very good. People have solved this problem. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, uh, if just out of curiosity, is it a dogma or like or not? So I'm assuming not. So. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. But uh, there are also a lot of features of Nginx that Rails just cannot uh, offer at all. Uh, for example, doing things like parallel server side includes uh, Rails. Just you cannot do that because you you hit certain limitations of the of of, of the Rails application that you run uh, with Nginx. With Nginx, you can actually put multiple websites into the same website and render it as a single response and do it fast. Right. With Rails, you cannot. And you can do that way before the request hits your Rails application, which is slower. Yeah. Does that answer the question in any way? Yeah, it does. It does perfectly. Thank okay. you. Uh, hello. Yo. Uh, 
thank you for your presentation. Could you please explain to me the scene? Uh, you just said that uh, there's a couple of middlewares run right before an action executes. Yep. So is there a way to uh, avoid an execution of uh, an, a middleware, whether I need it or not? So uh, let me explain. Um, in the live request, I really don't need to know the IP address of the requester. So can I avoid the execution of uh, a couple of middleware? Uh, yes, you can actually exclude the, uh, a, a specific piece of middleware. Assuming that another piece of middleware doesn't depend on uh, the information that is granted before, you can actually exclude it, yes. Uh, so, how should I do it? Uh, yeah, uh, I can Google with you. <laughs> <laughs> you. Uh, but yeah, you can exclude them, you can reorder them, there's a syntax for inserting a piece of middleware after it, a specific piece of middleware, and so on. So. Should it be uh, like a um, before action callback? No, 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 it's way before that because uh, the uh, so the action controller doesn't insert any middleware uh, by default. Uh, you can use, but it doesn't insert any middleware. Like you want to exclude the rack middleware that executes before the routing constraints, before uh, the routing. Uh, uh, Ask uh, whether it's possible to exclude the middleware right for one action and to exclude it for other. <sighs> Oh, that's a lot smarter. Uh, I think we can hack something, but then the question would be why? I, 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 because as part of the middleware, you get access to the environment hash, and the environment hash uh, gives you access to all of the stuff that is passed along with the request. So you can actually see what is the route that is, what is the URL that is being accessed, and you can execute some logic depending on that. I'm not sure whether you can skip calling the, the next middleware and just jump after one of them, uh, but you can hack your way around it, I'm pretty sure. Why then? And it probably will be a maintenance help, but uh, I, think, I think we can do something. Thank you. Yo, yeah, hey. what, was the, what was the report? Uh, yeah, nice presentation. Did you really run a Rails server on port 80? Are you running your Rails under root? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, Rails is very secure, right? If you're not using Sinatra, if you're just using Rails, it's uh, secure. Right, right, right. So, uh, you got that covered. <laughs> okay, let's do this. <laughs>